Good evening. Uh, let's see announcements. Um, Glenford needs school supplies and hygiene products. A suggestion list is on the back table. Please have them items in by October 20th. Um, October 31st, outdoor evening worship services with a following potluck. There's a sign-up sheet for food posted in the back as well for that. Uh, for those who know her, Julie S. moved uh, moved to south of Tampa. If you need her address, see Chris Neal. Uh, we wanted to continue to keep uh, Akeem in our prayers as he's training for a new job. Also, uh, we wanted to pray for uh, the family of David, family of David Myers Jr. as he has passed away. He was the uh, former pastor of South Maine. Southgate, okay, Southgate. Uh, okay, for this evening, opening prayer will be uh, Bob. I see Bob here tonight. Lord's table is Dave. Song leader, Jeremiah. Scott doing the uh, preaching, and the closing prayer will be uh, Bernie. And I guess just go ahead and uh, bow with me, and I'll do the opening prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you today faithfully requesting your guidance in our lives. Teach us, correct us, and lead us down your path of righteousness. With all of the current uncertainty in the world, let us remember to seek you, draw near to you, and find our answers in you. Please pray for the many friends and family members who are sick and struggling. Have mercy on them and heal them. Encourage us all to go about our week as it is a blessing to us and to others, displaying our Christian faith proudly. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. evening. I would say it's strange getting called Jeremiah while here, but I think the only person who would do that is Jeremy. Is He does not want to get confused, so I don't blame him. We'll open uh, this evening's service with numbers 473, Break Thou the Bread of Life. <clears throat> Break Thou the Bread of Life, dear Lord, to Come to this part of our worship.
to recall the Lord's uh, death. And we see early disciples doing that in remembrance of him. And as we surround the table again, let's focus on that sacrifice. Would you bow with me, please? Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the privileges that you've given us. We thank you now for this bread. We'd ask you to help the one that's uh, partaking the bread that, that you'd recall the sacrifice for you and, and for us. Through Jesus' name we pray. Amen. bow with me again please heavenly father we continue to thank you for those blessings you've given us the encouragement that we have and the comfort of the scriptures we thank you for this fruit of the vine again help us to focus on that tremendous statement of love that obedience that jesus demonstrated and the sacrifice for us through his name we give you thanks amen So have the privilege of, of giving that the work of the church would continue. The tray remains in the uh, vestibule. And let's give thanks to God again. Father, we thank you so much for the blessings you've given us. We ask you to help us as we uh, strive to do your work here. That we would use your treasury wisely. Help us to find the needs that, that are there and recognize the needs and address them and be uh, equipped to do that. We thank you for all the time that you've given us over the years to be able to help people in various ways in various places. Through Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now we'll sing number 98, Oh How I Love Jesus. <clears throat> There is a name I love to hear, I love to sing its worth. It sounds like music in my ear, the sweetest name on earth. Oh, how I love Jesus, oh, how I love Jesus, oh, how I love Jesus. Because he first loved me, it tells me of a Savior's love who died to set me free. It tells me of his precious blood, the sinner's perfect plea. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus, because he first loved me. It tells of one whose loving heart can feel my deepest woe, who in each sorrow bears a part that none can bear below. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus, oh, how I love Jesus, because he first loved me. And now if you're not hindered, I ask that you please stand with me as we sing number 303, Heavenly Sunlight. <clears throat> Walking in sunlight all of my journey Over the mountains, through the deep vale Jesus has said, I'll never forsake thee Promise divine that never can fail Heavenly sunlight, heavenly sunlight Flooding my soul Jesus. 
Jesus is mine. Shadows around me, shadows above me, never conceal my Savior and God. He is the light, in him is no darkness. Ever I'm walking close to his side. Heavenly sunlight, heavenly sunlight, flooding my soul with glory divine. Hallelujah, I am rejoicing, singing his praises, Jesus is mine. In the bright sunlight, ever rejoicing. Pressing my way to mansions above, singing his praises, gladly I'm walking, walking in sunlight, sunlight of love, heavenly sunlight, heavenly sunlight, flooding my soul with glory divine. Jesus is mine. Please be seated. <laughs> Pardon me, it's coming. Uh, Dave, did you hear anything about this morning uh, about Jerry and Kathy? Okay. They, yeah, they were here this morning. Uh, I just know sometimes if there's some family event going on, they usually make mention of it, and I didn't hear anything. So I didn't know. Of, uh, but, uh, and again, that's a very important question. Of Last week we talked about 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. Tonight we're going to talk about chapter 2. And when we talked about chapter 1, we saw of how those Christians there, how they were witnesses, how they were examples uh, to the surrounding people. And tonight what we want to notice is Paul, again, is one of the writers uh, to those in Thessalonica. And so really, the concern for Christians is going to be shown from that perspective uh, of that he's writing to them. He's wanting to know uh, how they're doing. And he makes mention uh, of how it is he's concerned and how, while they were there in person, they behaved and treated the fellow Christian. And so not only is it important to us as we look out this evening, as we see individuals perhaps uh, who are typically here missing, and to ask those questions of where they're at, to call them afterwards, of... Uh, I, I know it's happened over uh, multiple services. If one of you who typically are here and are not here, then the question is asked of, well, where are they? Well, what's going on? And, and people genuinely care about one another. And so it is that the church ought to be that way. We ought to be concerned for one another. <clears throat> Tonight, what we're going to see in chapter 2 are... Uh, that Paul and those others who were there and, and at the beginning of the church as they taught them the gospel, that they cared for the congregation in this way. The first thing he's going to make reference to is they cared for the Christians there like a nursing mother. They cared for fellow Christians like a nursing mother. That shows just how intimate of a relationship they had and how sincere uh, they were. It also tells us in chapter 2 that they care for them uh, like a father. So it's interesting in chapter 2 that we are given both descriptions of parents, like a nursing mother and like a father. Both roles are important, and that the Christians took on that role. The more mature Christians took on that role for the younger Christians. And then lastly, what we're going to see in chapter 2, uh, of he talks about wanting to come back to those Christians, wanting to meet again, and we'll learn why that is. And hopefully, you and I are wanting to meet again with Christians. And one day, hopefully, it can be said that we will meet with Christians uh, one day for eternity. So it is that we ought to be concerned about one another. If you have your Bibles open to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, we're going to start in verses 6 through 9. 6 through 9. And what we're going to do is we're going to, I have underlined those words that pertain to and show how they cared 
like a nursing mother. Six through nine, it says this. Nor did we seek glory from men, either from you or from others, when we might have made demands as apostles of Christ. But we were gentle among you, just as a nursing mother cherishes her own children. So affectionately longing for you, we were well pleased to impart to you not only the gospel of God, but also our own lives, because you have became, become dear to us. For you remember, brethren, our labor and toil for laboring night and day that we might not be a burden to any of you. We preach to you the gospel of God. We see uh, of Paul again is expressing those who are writing to the church. They expressed uh, of how concerned they were for them, uh, of how much work they put into those members there. We've looked at perhaps some of the other churches that were established there. We can talk about how they worked night and day with them, of that they may have been there for a short time. Other times we're told they spent two years with people. But they really wanted to make sure that all the people they came in contact to, all the people they were able to, to teach the gospel. So when you look through verses 6 through 9, you can see words as it describes of being gentle, one who cherishes, one who's affectionate, of how they've become dear to us. We see that the relationship had to be built, and now they have that close relationship. And then, uh, perhaps a very appropriate, saying laboring night and day. Hannah's uh, family got to come in for Labor Day. And with her parents, her brother and sister-in-law came with their new uh, baby. Uh, his name is Silas. And so uh, they all got to come to our house for the first time. We got to see Silas. He's about two months old. But the case for Silas is, is he liked to eat every two hours. And so uh, I like to eat, but not every two hours. <laughs> every three. But of every two hours is he was needing to eat, and so it's something that we weren't used to, we didn't think about. And so I don't know what it was like during the night, but I know if he cried out, whether he's hungry or whatever, there she was as a mother to him, so was Nathan, if he could uh, help in any way. But of understanding that a nursing mother is there for a child whenever the child needs the help, so whenever the child needs the comfort and the affection. And so it is just like a nursing mother, that's the description, that's what he is uh, making the comparison to of how they cared for, how they were concerned for those Christians. So it is an example for us today. While we can look at those in Thessalonica and their faith, their example, we also ought to look to Paul and those others because they are also Christians. And so we're able to realize what we're really uh, able to understand that this is the concern we ought to have, to be patient, long-suffering pe with people, uh, it's been said, and, and perhaps you know this as well, but there are some who will hear a lesson like the day of Pentecost, and there will be those that will want to repent after hearing the gospel once. But you also see examples in the Bible, again, as pointed out, that they spent a lot of time with the people. People had to study God's word. They had to really educate themselves about what the truth was before repenting, before being united with Christ. So it is our responsibility to build that relation. So it is our responsibility to labor night and day, especially when it comes to like-minded people, especially when it comes to children of God, we ought to be willing to do that, to help them so they may stay on the narrow path, walking in the light as Christ is in the light. But not only are we told in chapter 2 of this example of the nursing mother and are we showed uh, of that concern for one another, but we're also given the example of a father. So if you look at verses 11 through 12, 11 through 12. Again, have those words underlined pertaining to a father, but it says this, As you know how we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you as a father does, his own children, that you would walk worthy of God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. So again, we see the characteristics of a father, what a father does for his own child. He exhorts his child. He comforts his child. He charges his child to walk worthy. He wants to teach him what is right and wrong, wants the child to grow and to mature. And so just as a father would do that, as the father would encourage the child to overcome its weaknesses, its challenges, 
just as it would encourage his child to grow and mature, so again, we ought to, as the church, so it is as a Christian, you and I ought to reach out to one another, to instruct one another, to encourage, to insist that they must walk according to God's word. Again, he's making perhaps these very simple comparisons, and we're thankful that uh, of, it's a comparison that many of us can perhaps understand, or we can have seen that shown to us. Uh, again, whether you, even if you have not been a mother, whether you've not been a father, but you can see that example by others who have held that role and how they are concerned and care about their children. So it is we must be concerned for our fellow Christian. There are Christians who are young in the faith, and we need to care for them as we would our own children. That's uh, a pretty, again, once you understand the comparison that he's making, that's a pretty serious thing for us to consider, and it's something uh, we may have to evaluate of how we treat one another, how concerned we are about one another. We see in the song, and rightly so, we, we see in the song about the family of God. We're told in Scripture we're brothers and sisters in Christ. And so it is we ought to treat one another like brothers and sisters in Christ, like the family of God. So it is in chapter 2 you see uh, of the concern for one another being example to us by a nursing mother. Then you see it uh, in the example of a father. And lastly, verse 17 through 20, about the meeting again. Why is it, Paul, why is it that those who had spent time with him originally would want to return back to these fellow Christians? 17 through 20. It says this, But we, brethren, having been taken away from you for a short time in presence, not in heart, endeavored more eagerly to see your face with great desire. Therefore we wanted to come to you, even I, Paul, time and again. But Satan hindered us. For what is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing? Is it not even you in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming. For you are our glory and joy. So 17 through 20, he explains that they wanted to come. Satan hindered them from coming. And while their presence, uh, while they weren't face to face with those Christians in Thessalonica, they had never left their heart, never left their prayers. They were always thinking and concerned about them. But he tells us here at the end, he tells us exactly why it is that he's so concerned about meeting them of why he's perhaps even writing this letter to them. Is it not even you in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming? Asking that question, that that be their glory, of to have these people who were lost in sin, but now have, would repent, be saved, and remain faithful to God. Wouldn't that be their glory? Wouldn't that be a wonderful thing? That these people not just repent for a number of years and then go back to sin, or uh, of turn away from God, back to false idols, as we, we talked about in chapter 1, but yet they would remain faithful all of their lives, obedient to God. And so, yes, Paul certainly is talking about wanting to meet them in person. He would be glad to meet them in person, so he could once again teach them to see their faith, to see those works at hand, but more importantly, of meeting them again in heaven, meeting them in eternity with Christ at his coming. You and I uh, of wanting to meet people again. Hannah and I have had, uh, in the short time we've had, we've been able to travel uh, from place to place, and so we know Christians in Indiana, we know Christians in Florida, we know Christians here in Ohio. And there are some of those people, as I said this morning, that if I retire from here, I may never see again. But it's, what it has been an encouraging thing is when we've left some of those people, knowing it may be for the last time, uh, of the statement would be made, if we don't see you again on this side of heaven, then we look forward to seeing you there in eternity. And so, again, it is wonderful if you and I can meet with fellow Christians here on this side and we can teach and we can encourage one another, if we can instruct one another. But may all that be done so that we can all be gathered in the presence of our Lord. Paul was concerned about the eternity of these Christians. The, que the question for us then this evening is, are we concerned for our fellow brethren and where they will spend 
eternity. Are we concerned in that way for our brother, for our sister in Christ? Are we willing to reach out to them, to labor night and day, to be like that mother, to be like that father, to take the examples of those in Scripture and to be that church today, to be that Christian today? That's the challenge. That is the thing that you and I must ask ourselves. That's the thing you and I must then do. So it is, as we look to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, and we talk about what, what things we can learn from this chapter, we see that there's a concern for one another. There's concern for Christians, and how that is done is by being the nursing mother, being the father, and looking forward to meet again. We should be willing to work day and night with Christians as a nursing mother takes care of her child. We should encourage other Christians to walk worthy of God, just as a father encourages his son. And we should be concerned with where our fellow brethren will spend eternity and be willing to meet with them to help them stay on the narrow path. If we see that Christian going aside, if we see them straying uh, from obedience toward God, then we ought to reach out. We ought to connect with them uh, and, and just, again, let them know of our concern, why it is we're reaching out to them. Because we want them to spend eternity. Because we don't want them to be lost forever. But so that they may be saved, so they may have eternity with their creator and their savior. So it is, as you're challenged with that, as you're thinking about that, if tonight you find yourself where you haven't been obedient to God, if you haven't been a servant to God like you should, if we need to study with you, if we can study with you, to pray with you, if we can help you in any way, we ask that you come forward and we stand singing the invitation song. standing for our closing prayer. Please. You bow with me. Dear God, our Lord and Father in heaven, we're thankful, Father, to be able to be here this evening. We're thankful, Father, for all of your blessings, and we're most indeed thankful, Father, for your Son, Jesus. We pray, Father, that you would be with those who are on the prayer list, that you would bless and strengthen each one of them and take care of them. We ask you, Father, that you would be with those who are unable to be here this evening, whatever the reason may be. We pray, Father, that you would see that they might be able to come back and be with us once again Wednesday evening. We ask you, Father, that you would go with us now as we leave this building and go to our separate homes and we pray, Father, that you would help us to make it there safely and, as I said, help us that we might be able to come back once again Wednesday evening to study your word together. We're thankful, Father, for Scott and the way he presented his lesson. We pray, Father, that you would continue to be with Scott and Hannah and be with each one of us here this evening. We ask you, Father, that 